All right, everyone. So welcome. That's music by Hydrogen C, a group out of uh, the Netherlands, Vereen ESN. Thought appropriate for the event. So welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Grillo, the event director for Air Miners. It's good to see so many people uh, in the Zoom today, new faces and old faces. Uh, so our event today, we're going to talk about hydrogen and how that relates to the practice of carbon removal. A few reasons why we're doing this. One, um, you know, for context, uh, the hydrogen economy has uh, has grown significantly over uh, the last uh, several years, and to the point where today, uh, new applications of hydrogen are becoming more and more uh, commonplace. Where uh, people are starting to predict that hydrogen will be a carbon-free fuel for the future. Uh, prompting the Great Lakes Institute, the Great Plains Institute rather, to publish a report about the practice of uh, creating carbon removal hubs on top of hydrogen hubs. That was one of the impetuses for our event today. And I'm gonna share a link to that Great Plains Institute report in the chat. Also, uh, several startups that we have represented in our, in our panel today uh, pr are pursuing or have pursued hydrogen products uh, as a byproduct of carbon removal. What we really want to unpack today is under what conditions are, uh, is hydrogen a, a viable solution for startups, knowing that that would be of interest to people in the audience who uh, might be considering going the path of producing hydrogen as well as removing carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, under what conditions might it not be such a viable product? And, if so, and uh, in what way, shape or form can hydrogen uh, be a useful pathway for a startup to pursue? Uh, and how does that overlay onto the practice of carbon removal? Uh, we could think of no better panelists to have here and no better moderator than uh, Catherine Goyce from Greentown Labs, who I'll introduce you to in, in uh, just in 30 seconds before I, uh, but before that, just some logistics notes. Uh, one, this is being recorded, uh, will be up on our YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, two is we're going to have a panel discussion for about you know for about forty minutes or so, Q and A for another fifteen. I'll come on with some announcements at the tail end, as well as uh, some really interesting air miners events coming up over the next couple of weeks. And then uh, at the top of the hour, we'll stop. That'll be the end of our main event, and we'll be here for networking for about maybe thirty minutes afterwards uh, in Zoom breakout rooms. Feel free to come to that. You don't have to. We're all busy. Um, but hopefully you can join us and get to know each other, not just know of each other, if the semantics makes sense. Uh, so thank you again for coming, and I will see you um, at the tail end of our main event today. In the meantime, I leave you in the hands of Catherine Goyce, our moderator, to introduce us and bring us into the discussion. Catherine. Thank you so much, Jason. Hello, everybody. My name is Katie Goyce. I am the Senior Director of Programs at Greentown Labs. And at Greentown, I run our Greentown Launch Programs, which are programs that accelerate partnerships between climate tech startups and corporates. So given today's topics, before we jump into it, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our Low Carbon Hydrogen Accelerator Program, which is with Shell, EPRI, the City of Houston, and the Urban Future Lab. And that is accepting applications through tonight at midnight. We also have the Carbon to Value Initiative, which is a carbon tech focused accelerator with the Urban Future Lab and Fraunhofer. And that program is accepting applications through April 29th. So given those two programs, you know, I personally have worked on these two topics in isolation, and it makes me really excited to be here today to talk about the overlap between carbon tech and hydrogen. So I wanna thank our panelists for being here. And let me give some quick introductions before we jump into the science and kind of the meat of our discussion. So today we've got two startups on our panel that are using biomass as a feedstock. Those startups and their founders here are Mac Kennedy, the co-founder and CEO of Moat. I'll ask Mac to give a wave. Moat is a carbon removal technology company that recycles wood waste into carbon negative hydrogen. We've also got Kelly Herring, the CTO and co-founder of Charm Industrial. And Charm takes agricultural waste and processes it into a carbon dense liquid called bio oil. This bio oil can then be pumped underground as a permanent carbon removal solution, 
or it can be gasified into a mixed renewable gas stream of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane, and that can be used to decarbonize heavy industries. So very cool. Look forward to hearing more about both of those technologies. And we also have two companies that are removing carbon dioxide from seawater. Those are uh, Planetary Technology, so Planetary Tech, recently renamed from Planetary Hydrogen. We've got Mike Kellens, the CEO here with us today. And Planetary Tech uses a mild antacid to increase the ability of the ocean to naturally uptake and store CO2 from the air while rebalancing ocean chemistry. And then finally, we also have Xin Chen, a project scientist at Sea Change. And Sea Change is implementing in situ ocean water electrolysis to produce hydrogen and mineralize carbon as carbonate and bicarbonate species. So let's turn to the science here. Both carbon removal and hydrogen are very important topics in the world of climate tech innovation, and they're, they're both really popular right now. So why does it really make sense to talk about them as one topic? Now, I'm not a chemist, and I'll ask our panelists to correct me if I say anything silly here, but essentially, carbon and hydrogen are the building blocks of several very important energy storage molecules for both life on Earth and our modern industrial economy, like carbohydrates, hydrocarbons, among many others. And together, they also play really important roles in the natural carbon cycle. And so if you can build up and break down molecules with carbon and hydrogen, you can not only create ways of storing and releasing energy that are relevant both to biological and industrial applications, but you can also manipulate parts of the carbon cycle. And of course, our carbon cycle needs some TLC right now. So with that context, I will ask each of our panelists to explain their core innovation in a little bit more detail and specifically to tell us how it relates to both carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And Mac, maybe we'll start with you at Moat. Awesome, thanks so much, really appreciate it. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having us, uh, Jason, Tito. Um, contrary to what many have said, um, my nose being broken is not from Tito and I getting in a fist fight. Um, I, I face planted on my bike, so had to clear that up from the beginning. Um, but yeah, so what we're doing at Moat is uh, really based on the work that my, my co-founder Josh Stolaroff did at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So um, in this getting to neutral paper that they put out, they looked at kind of every proven carbon removal pathway um, for, for California, and they found that um, they could hit really massive scale by doing gasification of wood waste to hydrogen coupled with carbon capture and storage. And fundamentally, um, it's because hydrogen has kind of the highest dollar per megajoule of the products that you could be making. And then gasifying biomass to hydrogen takes most of the CO2 out of uh, the biomass compared to other things you could do with it. So it really hits this sweet spot where it maximizes carbon removal and the highest value product. And so we realized early on that kind of the basic equipment to do this exists out on the market and has been out there for decades operating. And so what we decided to do as a company is develop uh, system integration technologies to put all of those pieces of proven uh, commercial equipment together. So that's what we've been developing. And um, yeah, super excited to, to dig more into it. Thank you so much, Mac. Shin, over to you. Um, thank you. So um, so uh, in the sea change, we are implementing the water electrolysis. So for uh, the audience that are not uh, familiar with the water electrolysis, it's one of the most common applied uh, abiotic reaction to produce hydrogen and uh, um, alkali, our base materials. Um, so um, the, the reason that we, we could use that uh, base or strong base we produce to react with the CO2 is because if you think CO2, uh, uh, it's high, it has a, like certain, you can think about it, it as a weak acid. So um, it can react with a strong alkali and a base in the uh, actually a downhill manner. Um, so whereby the reaction happens really naturally and doesn't need a, a kickoff energy. So the great thing is for water splitting, the alkali are co-produced with hydrogen, which can be used as a green fuel. Uh, as a as a green fuel. Um, so I think this uh, this is our core innovation and. Uh, uh, so industrially adapted, so most similar industrially adapted process is called a Cori alkali. You can um, uh, 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 refer, I can refer to that process, which is the most uh, 
uh, uh, I think commonly uh, methods to uh, produce a caustic, caustic soda and the hydrogen production at the same time. Um, so yeah, so um, we are mainly focused on uh, use the uh, produced alkalinity to immobilize um, um, CO2 as carbonate bicarbonate species, which, uh, which is uh, really stable for uh, thousands, if not millions of years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Shin. Kelly, do you want to tell us about CHARM? Sure. So CHARM Industrial um, is allowing the plants, effectively the agricultural waste, be it corn stover, wheat straw, and eventually, hopefully, other types of biomass um, to do the carbon removal for us through photosynthesis and the growth of the plant. And then we take those the leftover plants that would otherwise have rotted or um, have released that CO2 and, and methane back into the atmosphere, and we're putting them through a process called pyrolysis. That process and the machine um, that does it has been around for a while. Um, we are creating new modular machines that do pyrolysis that actually go to the field where the biomass is located to reduce biomass transport costs. Um, then we take those plants, we produce a bio oil from that. So that is a basically carbon dense liquid, really long chain of hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen, uh, or yeah, and all the different components there. And then we can then have two different pathways with that bio oil. So we can take the bio oil and take it to a well where we pump it underground. And that bio oil is actually going to um, stay within the formation because it is liquid. And it's also fairly um, like unstable in the formation. It will then just polymerize and turn into like this really sticky plastic and sink below the containing formation brine. We can also take the bio oil and um, send it to one of our gasification plants, which we're also developing. And those gasification plants can then gasify the bio oil from that liquid form into that gaseous form again. And that gas form, which is typically called syngas, um, is a combination of hydrogen, methane, um, and carbon monoxide. And those can be used to decarbonize heavy industries, either as like heat source or um, in the ones that we like the most, um, they actually want the carbon as well as the hydrogen and the heat that can come from breaking down those molecules. So um, specifically, we're focusing on steel production decarbonization right now um, through bio-oil gasification. So they're kind of our two um, pieces of um, what, the, what CHARM does as a process. Thank you very much, Kelly. And last but not least, Mike, tell us about Planetary Tech. Yeah, so Planetary Tech, uh, probably know us as Planetary Hydrogen. We just renamed the company um, because uh, we're finding that hydrogen, and we're, we'll dig into this, uh, hydrogen is awesome. It's part of our, part of our process, and it's important, um, but uh, it's not the central part, and, and we found that uh, our name was, was over-focusing us. So what we do, um, just to clarify, is, is actually... Uh, we actually add carbon to the ocean. We don't actually take carbon out of the ocean. Um, and very similar to sea change, we use a very similar sort of mechanism. Um, so right now on Earth, about 88% of the Earth's carbon is in our oceans as dissolved carbonates and bicarbonates. It is you know, the largest store of carbon on the Earth's surface. And it's where Mother Nature is naturally going to put all of our carbon over the next 100,000 years or so. So very long, grindy geological cycles can take a really, really long time. Our process fundamentally speeds that up. And the way that we speed that up is that we take a very mild form of alkalinity or an antacid essentially, and we add that to seawater. And by adding that very mild uh, antacid to seawater, we increase the flux rate or the speed at which carbon and the amount of carbon that ends up coming out of the atmosphere and going into the ocean, um, it, we, we increase that. With that additional carbon in the ocean, it's reactive with our antacid, and it forms that bicarbonate, which is a mild basic substance that helps to restore ocean chemistry and regrow things like corals and, and uh, shellfish. So it's a bit of an adaptation story at the same time as we add this alkalinity and this mild alkalinity into seawater. In order to produce that alkalinity, we do something very different, I think, than, than sea change. We actually go to a mine site, and we take mine waste uh, or tailings and we process those with electrochemistry in order to produce this, this highly purified and mild form of alkalinity or this very mild uh, antacid. And that electrochemical process is where we produce our hydrogen. So our hydrogen comes out at the mine site. Uh, it can be used there to decarbonize mining operations, or it can be used uh, in a, uh, as we scale up 
in a larger context to produce, uh, you know, uh, fuels or, you know, synthetic fuels, carbon negative fuels or other value added products from hydrogen. So that's how our process works. Thank you, Mike. Very helpful. And just to, to recap, I think for our audience here, uh, we've got two companies who uh, do ocean carbon sequestration. So that's sea change and planetary tech. And then two companies that use biomass as an input, and that is Moat and Charm Industrial. So I think kind of keeping those two categories in your head as we go through the discussion can orient you to some of what our panelists are talking about. And so as I understand it, uh, one of the biggest challenges with manipulating these molecules made from carbon and hydrogen is that the speed and scale at which these processes happen in nature, if they happen at all, is really nowhere near the speed and scale that we need for industrial applications. And that is exactly why technological innovation is so important. And so I'd love to ask each of our panelists to talk a little bit about the scale that they're currently operating at, as well as the scale that they hope to be able to reach. And Mike, maybe we'll we'll start with you. Sure, yeah, happy to. So we're, we're in a fun little transition point where we're halfway between, or we're, we've started to build out our pilot, we've completed our bench scale end to end. So we're up to that point and we're scaling up into the pilot. Um, from there, we're moving to a demonstration and then to full commercial. Uh, for us, demonstration is in the thousands of tons a year of, of CO2 capture. Um, and, um, and getting into commercialization will range probably at the first site that we start with our pilot site, uh, around 300,000 tons um, scaling up year over year into the couple hundred, a couple of million tons uh, and beyond. Uh, our scale strategy, like any strategy in like large industrial technology, uh, is going to be um, sort of a two-dimensional matrix where you have sort of you know scale up on site and scale up at different sites. Uh, and so um, as we scale into commercial, our expectation is that more and more sites will come online for us. Um, and that we, you know, scale essentially exponentially uh, in that commercial uh, scale um, target. Um, and uh, our goal is, and it's pretty ambitious, you know, I think it's, it's in our plan, but it's pretty ambitious is sort of get to a gigaton a year by 2035. And that that's where we'd like to be. Um, you know, uh, yeah, we can dig deeper on all the factors that play into that if you'd like, but, uh, but that's where we'd like to be. Thank you, Mike. Um, are you able to talk to the current cost that you're at and the cost you hope to get to as well? Sure. I mean, you know, we're still at a point where the costs are, as you would expect for a bench scale system, you know, they're not, they're not economical costs at this point in time, but we do expect to be well under the sort of hundred dollar a ton benchmark when we hit the million ton range. So this is where we, where we're, where we're targeting at the end. Super helpful. Thanks, Mike. Kelly, do you want to talk a little bit about your current uh, scale and cost and your targets? Sure. Um, so at Charm on the pyrolysis side, we're at the like early demonstration scales. So um, last year we, I think, sequestered around 5,000 tons of carbon dioxide, um, which is pretty big for the industry. But I think that just shows how how early the industry is in carbon removal. Um, that size is basically like on the we're we're demonstrating our 10 ton per day mobile pyrolyzers, um, and when we sell carbon removal we're at that $600 per ton um, CO2 equivalent price point. And we hope to move down the cost curve to be competitive with other nature-based solutions, um, probably as low as $50 per ton, but we see that as kind of many years out and a lot of things to unlock to get there. Um, on the gasification front and the decarbonization, we are at more of like the, we have a working pilot plant here at our facility and are working on with a, an EPC and um, some steel partners to do a demonstration at those facilities, which are probably a few years out. Um, and we hope to be able to like use the cost that they would be effectively paying for methane or natural gas um, as a comparison to what we wanna hit as targets for that. Um, but it's a little bit more in the, um, the negotiations of how you how you run a demonstration with a, a large industry is the costs are, are kind of baked into a lot of those those numbers. So. Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. And it's it's really interesting to think about those multiple different pieces that you talked about, because it isn't just none of you are really just doing one process here. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but Shin, I would love to hear a little bit about your current scale and cost and where you're hoping to go. 
Yeah, so our, we are also at the, in the process of building a pilot scale plant. Uh, so the plan is targeting, so for the single plan, we are targeting one metric ton to three metric tons per day, which is uh, on the order of 1,000 ton per year of carbon removal. Um, so the, the plant uh, itself, whereby to, it can remove the, uh, was targeting the re atmospheric and also the dissolved ocean carbon removal uh, at a targeted cost of, well, um, below the $100 per ton of CO2, ideally $70 per ton of CO2, uh, uh, generally with compensated the green hydrogen cell. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of the efficiency, uh, I think we can reach about four kilogram of CO2 uh, immobilized or carbonated uh, per cubic meter of the seawater treated, which is the, the core innovation of our uh, technology here. And it will still be, will remain true for the uh, pilot, uh, pilot scale plant. Thank you, Shin. Thanks. And then Mac, over to you, same question. Yeah, so um, part of our strategy is, is going um, straight to commercial scale using equipment that's already commercial, um, repurposing it in this novel process flow. So um, to kind of uh, rapidly deploy, we, we set on this strategy of, of using equipment that's already out there and been kind of proven and, you know, project financed. Um, so, um, you know, the, uh, the assembly of all this equipment is, is what's new. And, and so, um, you know, technically our first commercial plant will be demonstrating this uh, first of a kind process flow, but, um, you know, our downstream equipment has used sin gas before and our, uh, you know, our gasifier has, has put out the clean sin gas before. So it's really not a major leap in terms of kind of the basic understanding of, of putting it together. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the strategy there. And then in terms of the cost per ton of CO2, um, initially, we're probably going to be around the $60 per ton of CO2 mark. Um, and then as we kind of uh, have multiple deployments getting below $50 per ton of CO2. Um, the first project we're doing is going to be in the range of 150,000 tons of CO2 per year, uh, with potentially all the way up to 275,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, so we're kind of uh, working through uh, our strategy on the, the size of this first project right now in terms of um, you know, talking with uh, our potential project partners, um, but, uh, but yeah. Awesome, thank you, Mac. And thanks to, to everybody for giving us some context to the, the numbers and the scale that we're talking about here. One thing I noticed, um, a lot of you described or answered that question in terms of the CO2 that you're, you're currently removing. Um, and another piece of it is that really, in, in some ways, I think most of you really are across two different markets, both the carbon removal market and also the hydrogen market. And those are very different spaces in a lot of ways. I'm curious um, if there's one market or the other that you're more bullish on at the moment or how you kind of think about those two opportunities. And anybody can start and jump in. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take that. So, um, you know, we look at uh, carbon removal and renewable hydrogen as both uh, trillion dollar markets over the next couple of decades. So um, they're both gonna be really massive markets, um, but they're both you know barely in their first inning. Um, so it's really exciting to see kind of the trajectory that those are heading on. Um, you know, in terms of our process, uh, most of the value of what we're doing comes from the carbon removal. Um, so this is kind of the uh, um, change in, in going from, you know, what has traditionally been called BECS or bioenergy carbon capture and storage to bikers, biomass carbon removal and storage. So the emphasis there on this new term is on the carbon removal itself and not really the energy value. The hydrogen has, has a lot of value in this process, um, which is new. Traditionally, people did electricity, which is a lot less valuable. Um, but, but even then with making hydrogen, most of the value comes from the carbon removal and that gets us really excited um, and allows us to outcompete you know, uh, doing water electrolysis to make hydrogen, for example, because, you know, ultimately our long-term production costs are kind of similar to water electrolysis, but most of our value comes from carbon removal, which gives us a huge advantage over other ways of making renewable hydrogen. So I can, I can follow on that because I think we're similar in a way. I think that the uh, hydrogen is an important subsidy for the carbon removal in our process. And, uh, one of the challenges with hydrogen, what we discovered over the last um, two years of developing this, because we, we, I think we started out, our pitch was very simple. It was, hey, we're going to make 
think what, what Mac, you're saying very similar, like we're gonna make the cheapest hydrogen in the world because we're offsetting it with carbon credits. It's gonna be amazing. Um, but what, what we found pretty quickly was that uh, hydrogen logistics are really hard. Um, and, you know, moving hydrogen is really hard. Um, that infrastructure doesn't exist uh, at, at any uh, real scale unless you're sitting in a very specific place. You know, there's a, a giant pipeline, hydrogen pipeline that circles the, the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico and sort of the Gulf Coast. Um, and there's a, a fairly extensive one in Europe as well. But if you're not actually sitting there on that pipeline, uh, your logistics for hydrogen are, are, are severely challenged. And so um, uh, that's where we sort of, this is why we renamed ourselves actually, this is sort of going from hydrogen to tech was because, um, you know, carbon removal is is location independent. If you want to get a LCFS credit for, for direct air capture, for example, you don't have to be in California in order to do that. You can do that like literally anywhere. And that's true of pretty much any, any carbon removal technology. Um, so, what we were finding was because so much more of our car of our um, call it mass uh, was was in carbon. You know, we do you know roughly uh, thirty six to thirty seven tons per per ton, ton of CO two removed per ton of hydrogen we produce. Um, the uh, the use of hydrogen in C two uh, was a much stronger and higher use and higher value use than trying to take it off site and do something else with it. Uh, for for certain levels of scale. Now, of course, you get to a certain scale, and it just starts to make sense, right? If you can uh, build it up. But I I remember well a conversation we had with a refinery where we said, Hey, listen, we're going to produce, you know, we're going to get up to our fifty thousand tons of CO two per year, and this is how much hydrogen we're going to produce annually. Uh, you're only a hundred kilometers away from us. Sorry, Canadian, uh, seventy miles, whatever. And uh, and um, you know, you're uh, we'll drop it on a truck and we'll send it up, and it won't be that far. It won't be a big deal. And they said. The amount of hydrogen you're sending us, it's not worth us to build the infrastructure to take it off the truck. And so you're sort of at this point where uh, the logistics of it sort of mean that uh, you have to be very specific about how you use the hydrogen um, and and what you do with it to make it to make it high value. Fascinating. Chin, go ahead. Yeah, so I would very much agree. Um, with Mike and uh, Mac. So we are actually focusing on the carbon removal at the moment. And uh, um, we, so it depends, we eventually the hydrogen production for the long run, but it depends on the need of the, the CDR. So whether we can hit the mid, uh, mid century goal and the uh, carbon removal goal and the, the situation thereof. Uh, of course, for the hydrogen production, it's, um, so we, we envision that it's as a, a important, a play an important role in the fu future fuel and energy system. But uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, issues like uh, Mike uh, 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 expressed. Uh, so especially for the hydrogen uh, infrastructure, for the for the transportation storage, and you know, how do how could we minimize the the costs um, and also the uh, increase the efficiency of the usage? Thank you, Shin. Yeah, Kelly, anything to add? Um, yeah, I think in the in the short term, the customers like uh, Stripe and Shopify and Microsoft have really accelerated us to allow us to do carbon removal and accelerate those pathways. Um, whereas the the heavy industries have been a little bit slower, mostly because they're relying on subsidies or incentives to work through some of the um, the like techno economic analysis or the the cost benefit of doing renewables. Um, be it syn gas or hydrogen. And then uh, as well as that, they do rely on a lot of data. So for some of these really early technical demonstrations, they would require um, like several demonstrations, several like scales of demonstration before being willing to put a more substantial plant together, which is allow allows you to unlock like the massive amount of flow that goes through these industries. Um, so that will take certainly several years and eventually would love to see that be the more like long-term or decarbonization be the more long-term solution. But in the meantime, carbon removal is definitely taking off for us. So it's been exciting. Wow. That, that is like so interesting to me. I think the fact that all four of you essentially said that the carbon removal market in the short term is um, kind of more important to your core business. And, and there's things that are attractive about it compared to the hydrogen market. You know, if I had guessed coming into this discussion, I, I might've said the other way around simply because the carbon removal market seems so new and um, so kind of dynamic and still being established um, 
Whereas the hydrogen market, there, there are industrial uses for hydrogen today and, and there's an existing market there. Um, so to me, what that says is that, you know, groups like air miners and some of these really forward thinking uh, companies like Stripe and Microsoft have made a big difference in catalyzing this ecosystem and propelling this market forward to the point where you can feel like it's a, a more certain market for you than a very established market like hydrogen. I think that's just fascinating. And then to kind of flip that on its head, um, are there any exogenous factors that if they changed would like either maybe change your answer to that question or just be transformative for your business overall? Any exogenous um, factors that you could foresee happening? Um, I can take a, this one to start, if that works. Um, so for us, I think it's kind of threefold. I think more access to the voluntary carbon removal market. So having other companies take up the the same sort of mission or um, like directive of being able to pay for carbon removal, especially on some of the more experimental pathways would be really exciting. Um, more coalition building around 45Q and like LCFS and some of the other government um, like subsidies or government incentives for that would allow us to do some rulemaking and actually ha have access to some of those um, things that allow us to come down the cost curve. And then third, it would be just making sure that we um, encourage the steel industry as well as connect with people in the steel industry and other heavy industries that might be able to decarbonize to allow us to get started on those projects that might be many year long projects. Um, so uh, then even like communicating within themselves or having incentives to start some of these early projects to decarbonize is really helpful for us. Thanks, Kelly. Um, something that I'll mention uh, as well is I think, you know, we're seeing a growth and in, in Rohini and the chats just mentioned this, it's sort of like this growth in, um, in renewable fuels. And we're seeing that both in aviation and shipping that is quite interesting. Uh, one of the ways that we get around uh, the concept of uh, the challenge of, of transporting hydrogen and sort of changes the equation, I think probably for all of us in a, in a significant way when it comes to fuels is, is fuel synthesis and uh, going from hydrogen to a different fuel. Um, much as I run a company that is producing hydrogen, I'm not actually very bullish on hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, that's just something that I think is, um, hydrogen is a primary fuel, the logistics are really challenging. And uh, I think there's gonna be pressure from, you know, the bottom and the top. If the bottom is sort of commuter vehicles, that's probably gonna go battery electric long before it goes hydrogen. And, you know, Toyota and I can argue on this all we'd like, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, we're probably gonna see it more electric than hydrogen. And then from the top down, we're gonna probably see a lot more synthetic fuels coming in with ammonia, methanol, um, and other sort of uh, synthetics for, for hard to decarbonize uh, things like airplanes and big boats. So that, you know, is, and then meeting in the middle somewhere around trains and you know 18 wheelers is going to be sort of a um you know that that's going to be the battleground if you will of, of where sort of primary hydrogen as a fuel might might play out but but definitely um continued innovation and uh modular deployment of synthetic fuel generation capacity within within areas that can do um uh, carbon removal would would definitely encourage uh less location dependence on you know, sort of uh, technologies like ours in terms of, of carbon removal. Yeah, synthetic fuels, very, very interesting. Really, really interesting there. Sheen or Mac, you want to jump in on exogenous factors? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think, Katie, as you mentioned before, that the carbon market are actually uh, as a, as a new, newly emerged uh, markets. And I think a well-defined carbon market, it will be essential for the company to grow and they expand. Uh, so implementing the carbon credit or any form of carbon credit will definitely draw more attention or investment attentions or opportunities that could help the startups like us um, uh, uh, to go beyond the uh, uh, like large scale carbon removal. But uh, yeah, so um, I think uh, another aspect out into this could be the uh, how could we, uh, I think the other uh, panelist has talked on this, and we have, how could we uh, just uh, relatively endorse a newly emerged, uh, but well-defined effective uh, CDR technology uh, fast and quickly. And, uh, you know, how to quantify and accredit uh, the technology's efforts, you know, uh, properly and uh, uh, comprehensively. Um, 
Um, I, I think that the other things I want to mention is the society support is important as well. Like for instance, how could we endorse and uh, encourage and uh, um, uh, you know convince the uh, talents, especially especially the young talents, to devote their career to a carbon management? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of still other people thinking the climate change is a make believe. Uh, so yeah, of course when we. Uh, talk about the gigaton level of uh, carbon removal, it cannot be accomplished just by one or two facilities, CDR facilities. It's essentially the um, uh, global uh, scale of collaboration and how to, could we you know, achieve, achieve this uh, um, a consensus, consensus uh, in global and local societies are, I think it's essential as well. Yeah, Sheen, I couldn't agree more. Definitely is gonna take a village and I think that's exactly part of the reason we're all here today. For sure. Mac, anything you want to add on exogenous factors? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think once uh, the low California's low carbon fuel standard market, um, you know, it was recently amended to allow for direct air capture, uh, you know, and I think once that opens up even further just to the carbon removal uh, and, you know, biogenic pathways, I think that, you know, really helps carbon removal go gangbusters. And uh, that's something we're really keen on. Absolutely. Thanks, Mac. And coming back to something that Mike was mentioning earlier, this challenge of infrastructure um, and co-location and sort of getting your outputs to their ultimate destinations. I'm curious if any of you have any thoughts on the concept of carbon and hydrogen hubs. Um, there's that great Great Plains Institute report that just came out that looked at uh, places across the country that would be good potential locations for hubs that would utilize carbon and hydrogen together at scale. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on that concept? Do you think that that would help you out? Is that promising? Do you see drawbacks there? Uh, any reaction to that concept? Uh, I think I'm in supportive. I'm in supportive of the idea. Um, uh, I think the hubs can uh, definitely provide, uh, you know, industrial partnership and uh, opportunities to de-risk de um, any uh, kind of early stage technologies development. And it's certainly easier to, uh, you know, build a, um, a supportive network uh, of this kind of uh, informed, uh, informed stakeholders um, within the hubs, uh, you know, to accept uh, to accelerate the commercialization of the technology. Um, but I do notice, based on the uh, reports, that the uh, location of the current hubs are, um, I think, heavily rely on the geological CO two sequestration sites, which are. Uh, uh, I think it's based on uh, CO2 uh, capture and pure CO2 injection, uh, but uh, I think I envision the uh, future hubs are more, um, you know, CDR technology adaptive. For instance, the hub located on the coasts uh, will co-benefit the uh, ocean-based technologies, whereas the, you know, hubs near the geological uh, CO2 sequestration sites are uh, going to be co-benefit more on the uh, carbon capture and injection technologies. Makes a lot of sense. So sounds like you think in concept it's a, it's maybe a good good framework, but in terms of execution, you'd like to see it not only focus on, focus on the, the sequestration piece, but also some kind of alternative pathways for, for carbon removal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'll just Great. say, um, you know, in the, the Gulf Coast, there's already, you know, uh, a network of CO2 pipelines and hydrogen pipelines. And it's really allowed a lot of activity there. Um, and, and we've already seen kind of the, the demonstration there of, of how that can change the economics of a lot of different projects. Um, so I think, you know, uh, seeing that in, uh, in different areas, I think will be really helpful in uh, putting new projects online, especially in California where, uh, you know, the, uh, the renewable fuels market is, is really uh, exciting. So um, you know, LA Basin is a great place with the ports there. And um, I think there's gonna be a lot of other great locations as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I see Jason is, is slacking me a question he's got. He says, you know, could port facilities be a hydrogen CDR hub? I mean, that's certainly another, another possibility. Lots of different uses there for sure. Yeah, there's a, I think there, I think there's a lot of potential there. I think the, you know, for port facilities, we're already seeing some leaders in that space. So like when you, especially in Europe, um, uh, there's some big ports that are, are looking at hydrogen in a, in a really serious way. A lot less focus on, on CO2 when it comes to ports. Um, and uh, I, I would say that the industry, the, the shipping industry is largely split between 
which hydrogen derivative they want to go forward with. Uh, I think you, you see that it's easier to make carbon neutral or, or you know, in our cases across this, this group, carbon negative uh, ammonia. Um, but there are serious safety concerns. Uh, if you talk to somebody who is a ship captain, they are not entirely comfortable, you know, driving something that's powered by ammonia in a lot of cases. Um, whereas methanol, uh, because it still has a carbon, you know, footprint, um, you have to also source uh, your, your carbon from either air or from a biological source if you want to get to sort of low or negative carbon uh, methanol. So there's, there's a lot of, I think ports are a really interesting space for this. And there's a lot of thought around this. And I do think that forward-looking ports are going to have to be thinking about, you know, how they get in on the fuel supply for, for next generation shipping. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot we could talk about um, in terms of industrial hubs. In the interest of time, let's move on. I think we're getting toward the end of our panel discussion here before we go into audience Q&A. Um, I think it's really clear that both the hydrogen and the carbon removal industries together or separately could be game changing for, for climate. Are there any guardrails that you think are needed either formally through regulation or informally through industry norms to ensure that the climate and environmental justice benefits of these technologies actually materialize as the industries grow? I can try, try to take a stab at this. <laughs> um, so I would say that obviously, um, due to some of the like fraudulent removals in the nature-based world that we've been seeing pop up um, around, I think it's really important for some of the newer pathways to adopt a really like clear verification approach, um, but also something that is like economical and feasible from a scaling perspective. Um, I think that's kind of the, the dichotomy we found is like, we wanna do as much verification as possible, but some of the verification pathways are actually quite expensive. So we're trying to find this middle ground of like making sure that we're being very transparent and doing all the due diligence for, um, for our customers and for ourselves internally. One of our values is it, it's the same as the um, biomass car removal value of like first do no harm, but making sure we're covering all those bases, making clear, clear plans for how we evaluate the effects of our carbon removal and the effects of our pathways um, and reporting on them as, as much as possible as we go along and making sure that we're um, figuring out how we balance that with um, scaling and um, monitoring generally across the board. So I think that's, that's kind of the portion of some of the newer um, players within the group of like, we wanna make sure that people have a lot of trust in new pathways. And then the other aspect is that I don't think people really fully understand how some of the incentives in government is really being utilized by either the, like being utilized more by the um, enhanced oil, oil recoveries of the world, as opposed to some of these newer greener solutions. So 45Q for example, um, is really only being accessed by enhanced oil recovery, which is not, not what people are thinking, right? They're thinking this is this carbon, um, incentive that allows all these like green solutions to get through, but they're not really allowing to do that through the specific rule process that they have. So I think having a lot of education around some of those things, how we communicate these incentives and these um, specific uh, like areas and laws within the climate space, as well as like making really solid pathways for verification and for scientific study for the new pathways is, is going to be important. Yeah. So really that, that transparency and, and just general societal education. So, so key, couldn't agree more, Kelly. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I think Kelly's answer was perfect. And I, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason, I do have one more. If we have time for one more, I've got a quick uh, question for everyone to, to wrap up the panel before we move to audience Q&A. Just simply put, um, what insights would you each share to someone who's just now starting off with a carbon removal company that also produces hydrogen gas as a byproduct. I can jump in on this. I think um, uh, there's a few things, uh, you know, um, uh, focus on the smallest possible thing that can work uh, is, you know, the generally the, the thing and try to prove your process end to end before you invest too much in it. 
uh, make sure that you understand the logistics because they actually really, really matter. Uh, it's not just technology. You have to get beyond technology and get into the logistics of, of the solution that you're building. And, um, uh, you know, think big. I think that's the key thing too, right? We have to be thinking at scale. I think everybody on this call and on this panel um, thinks in terms of climate scale. And if you're not thinking in terms of climate scale and you're not thinking like, you know, what does this actually truly look like at a gigaton scale and is it possible, um, then it's difficult to design things properly. It's not to say you have to be, you know, you have to build small and think big is, is how I would put it. Thank you, Mike, great points. Um, I couldn't agree more with Mike on the the scale. One of our values at Charm Two is gigatons are bust, and it like makes us forced to think about the bigger picture when even we're making some small decisions. Um, otherwise, uh, the logistics, like Mike mentioned, and how that relates to your uh, life cycle analysis. So I think a lot of the times people don't really do that fully baked life cycle analysis until later on. They feel like they can't; it's not approachable to them, or they need to get some like third party to do it. But it's it's good to just start at those economics from the very beginning and really understand both like the carbon pathway and then the um, what carbon you're creating or you're using along the way to get there and making sure that all of those close before going too far down a pathway. Thank you, Kelly. Three points, Snack. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I think I really admire the companies on this panel and I think they're really thinking about the fundamentals. And um, I think that's just the only thing I would add is just, you know, really focused on kind of the fundamentals. And I think there's a lot of opportunities um, in commercializing where you can kind of shortchange yourself and say, well, you know, um, there's a there's a more mature market, a readily available market for natural gas. Why don't we just make natural gas? But there's a lot of reasons on the fundamentals why we want to make hydrogen. And initially the market was a lot less developed than, you know, when we started the business two years ago, but we're really glad we've kind of stuck on this path because fundamentally it's just a lot better um, even though it's been a little harder to, to commercialize and taking longer and less obvious. But, um, you know, I think that's what's so great about the companies on this panel is um, I think fundamentally what they're doing is really interesting. Couldn't agree more. So interesting. Fascinating. Shin, any last thoughts from you on what yeah, uh, I new think, entrepreneurs should know? Um, yeah, so um, I, as a project center, we don't, without much of uh, entrepreneurial uh, experiences, but I would very much agree with uh, uh, Mike and uh, Kelly mentioned before. I think thinking about the process at scales constantly will definitely help uh, the development of the process. And uh, because uh, based on my experience, a lot of things doesn't make sense or meaningless uh, unless it's brought up to scales. So that's my two cents into this question. Absolutely. Thank you, Sheen. So let's jump into some audience Q&A. Sure. Um, we're going to ask uh, Hannah Hauptman, are you, are you here? Can you, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and asking you a question, you had a really good question about environmental justice concerns. Um, of course. Hi, all. Um, thank you so much to all these great panelists for uh, your questions. I think something that has been on my mind as I've explored the space, and I'll say that I do not work at a startup, so this is coming from a um, outside perspective, but I think one question that I've been thinking about a lot is how are early stage companies like yourselves or others thinking about community engagement in these sort of pilot or demo scale plants, um, in particular to address local safety concerns, um, you know, historic concerns with how tied this is to oil and gas infrastructure, especially in places like the Gulf Coast, um, and sort of how you think about that early community engagement then laying the right groundwork for community support for your Matt, you know, your larger scale commercial plants. Um, I can take this one, um, at least from Charm side. Uh, we are first engaging the farmers. I think that's our first kind of interaction point for some of our demos. So we have to buy biomass from them and really understand um, some parts of their process and what they're willing to sell for and how we can um, work on like the, the, like all sorts of justice, climate, racial, uh, environmental justice aspects of how we access and, and like lift up those communities. So there's that aspect of it. Um, we also, in some of like our well efforts, so much of it is related to very similar oil and gas infrastructures. And so even though we don't want to work necessarily with those oil and gas companies to do this work, we do want to be able to lift up those communities that 
have people whose jobs might be displaced by the reduction in the oil and gas industry. So we're excited about bringing them on board to do more um, specific carbon removal work. Um, and that's that's kind of the initial interactions that we've had with the general community, um, but I'll ultimately want to not necessarily have environmental impacts and, and always thinking about ways that we might be affecting the, the environment surrounding us and how we mitigate that and how we uh, measure that to make sure that we don't we don't have unintended, unintended and uh, like unfortunate consequences for what we're doing is on an early experimental scale. Yeah, I can, uh, you know, I think Kelly, when you guys are working on on the land side, we have a little bit of a different um, take on the ocean side, of course, and and uh, you know equally important, I think, to to consider environmental justice issues. And I think whenever you do an intervention, like for us, uh, you know, it's not a constrained intervention. So we're going out there and we're putting alkalinity into the seawater, and as you do that, you're you're adjusting ocean chemistry. Now, the funny thing about it is. Our biggest problem is once you put it out there, it dilutes so quickly, it's actually hard to detect. Um, so we actually have more trouble on the MRV side than we think that we're gonna have concerns around like making any kind of an impact on, on the ocean's chemistry itself. Uh, you know, sort of the fundamental of this is very small effect over a very, very large area creates a big effect in the total atmosphere, but a very small effect in the ocean. But having said all of that, you know, there are concerns about these kinds of things. And, you know, when you make an intervention in the ocean, which is global commons, we have to be very cautious and 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 you know uh, very consultative in our approach. So what we do is, while but there's no biological components to what we do, I would say roughly 50% of the research um, that we are sponsoring or or doing is biological research. We're looking at corals, we're looking at phytoplankton, we're looking at uh, oysters, and we're looking at you know pretty much anything that enhanced alkalinity within the ocean could affect the growth rate of. And so far, it's incredibly positive. You know, you see sort of like, um, you know, there's a, a, a seminal sort of study that was done at uh, on the Great Barrier Reef uh, by Albright and Kildera, and that was, um, you know, sort of uh, adding uh, alkalinity to the Great Barrier Reef. They saw about a seven percent increase in calcification rates in corals. So these are sort of like really good indicators that, as we, and it kind of makes sense. You know, you're all you're really doing is rebalancing ocean chemistry back to where everything that is in it evolved at, you know, sort of that back to that pH, but it's still something that we want to continually be sort of engaging in research with. And then as Kelly mentioned, you know, engaging communities in that research, I think is a really important part of the equation. When we look at something like what happened with ocean iron fertilization um, and some, you know, unrestrained experimentation that was done without, you know, strong scientific rigor, that, not only was a bad thing to do, it turned out like it's not a particularly good idea, but also uh, what ended up happening was it, it really soured, you know, a lot of this kind of ocean CDR uh, in the eyes of, you know, the environmental community and things like that. So for us, we're taking a very focused outreach approach, which is all about, you know, can we get uh, a, um, you know, can we get, you know, indigenous engagement on the coastal community side of things in what we're doing? Can we get uh, government engagement? Can we build, you know, research steering committees that involve a wide range of participants so that we can make sure that as we go through that research and we report these results, you know, people see this and it can be communicated and we can have these conversations about what's safe and what's not. Um, you know, for us, it's like we can go out there and do what we want to do at the couple hundred million ton range of, of CO2 annually with existing permitted outfalls. We don't need any other permits. We don't need any other permission. We can just go and do it, but we don't think that's a good idea, right? So fundamentally, we want to make sure that that science is watching what we're doing, that those communities are engaged in what we're doing and that we move forward with, uh, with that approach. So that's how we're approaching it. Great, great. Um, we are just about the end of time. Um, you, lots of really good questions. Uh, you know, we have people who have asked about uh, Shin, your uh, technology and how it is used with chlorine, uh, or the, and you know, Mike Robinson had a really interesting question about verification of carbon removal. Um, questions about battery metals. I mean, a lot of things co coming up uh, in the in in the chat. Um, what I can do is, if we don't have time to get to them, we can uh, take the chat log and send it to each of you after the 
uh, after we're done and then um, you can answer it offline and then we'll send it back to each of the askers, uh, people who are posing the questions. Does that make sense? Um, any other, I guess, thoughts, comments, concerns? Oh, um, sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat. So you were mentioned that about regarding the chlorine production for CHNG electro, uh, for the CHNG process. I, I would uh, just a quick comment re regarding that re without relating uh, uh, too much uh, technical detail. So, uh, so we are, we are our, one of our core innovations is to break the oxygen chlorine scale. Um, so to minimize the chlorine production, of course, chlorine is, is could be a very, um, a uh, valuable product, but we don't want to saturate the market or chlorine market due to the existing uh, chlorine uh, alkali process. Um, so we have, uh, uh, I think uh, we could call it upstream control of chlorine production and the downstream control of the chlorinization uh, processes. But yeah, so I don't know if that's sufficient for the question. I think that I think that gets to it. Sorry, sorry for the time. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I, th I think that gets to it. Uh, Robert Cormier, it looks like you have a real quick question. So I do. Yeah. If you can get it, if we can get it done in like a minute or two, feel free. Less Otherwise, than a I, minute, because we're yes. just about at the end. Perfect. Uh, just making a comment that um, nature uses sunlight and water photosynthesis, right, to upcycle CO two into more interesting products, valuable products. And water is that source of hydrogen. Even though bioreactors today don't appear to scale at the same rate that chemical engineering does, the energetics, the thermodynamics are far more favorable, right? Because if you're doing industrial upcycling of CO2, it costs you a lot of energy to make hydrogen, a lot of carbon. And if you go the electrolysis route, it's still a lot of hydrogen. It's 286 kilojoules per mole. That is less than a minute. <laughs> Couple Thanks. couple CO2, let CO2 tur turbocharge bioreactors. Thanks, Robert. Um, okay. Uh, well, yeah, just quick comments regarding that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's calling back to the, recalls the, I think it's the, uh, the guard reels that was uh, one of the uh, questions that we mentioned. I think uh, in terms of hydrogen production and carbon removal in using electricity, the electricity, uh, Electricity, I think, uh, really important to have a decarbonized grid. That's 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 a uh, uh, that's very important as well. So, great, great, Catherine. Any any final thoughts for our audience before we? Well, just thank you. Thank you for thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you for sharing about your companies with us today. Thank you for to our audience for your attention and your fantastic questions. And thanks to air, air miners for putting on a great event. Well, thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, Katie, thank you for being such an excellent moderator today. Uh, obviously, to our audience, uh, you've made it this a wonderful event uh, with, all, with all your questions. And again, the chat's really cracking with people uh, people answering each other in the chat, which is always fantastic to see. I added a bunch of links there. Um, one is the audience uh, survey. So let us know what you thought. Uh, we always strive to make our events as great as we can possibly manage. So. Anything that went well, especially things that didn't go so well, let us know and we can adjust and course correct. Also links for our next Air Miners event, which is a co-founders meetup. Uh, it's gonna happen a week from today. If you are a founder of a company looking to find someone else to co-found a company with, you've got an idea, you wanna, you're maybe business oriented or maybe you're science oriented. You wanna find someone who has a, a, who has a complimentary skill set, and you want to get something started. That's the event to come to, our co-founders meetup. Uh, where you'll be, we'll pair you up in kind of rapid fire succession uh, with meeting other people who may you might want to found a company with. Um, also, look to our Air Miners YouTube channel for the recording of this event. We'll have that up in a couple of days. And our fan event, Friday Afternoon Networking, F A N, is going to happen this upcoming Friday, the 18th. So, always a good time to get to know each other in Air Miners, not just know of each other. Um, and with that, we're at the official top of the hour. So thank you so much for, uh, for your time and attention and hope you have a wonderful day and hope to see you at an Air Miners event in the future. I'm gonna stop the recording and that'll be the end. And then we'll stay on for a little bit while longer for those of you who are on network, but 
if you've got to go, uh, no worries. We'll see you again. Thanks. Thank Everybody. you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone.